so it's very, very good to be proactive when you're doing an estate plan. Um, they say the best time to do estate planning is when there is no need to do so. That is kind of the mindset you want to go in today, living with peace of mind. So a lot of times people will call my office and they'll say, I want the best estate plan. I want a trust. I want a will. I want this. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. You know, there's no such thing as the best estate plan. Estate planning is not a one size fits all proposition. Every estate plan is for each individual client and every estate plan is different. Uh, so when I, how I define the best estate plan, it's kind of like that plate lunch on the slideshow. It's, you know, if you like extra lomi salmon, extra poi, if you're nice to the auntie, she might give you some. So the definition that I use is what is chosen by an informed person. So my job as an estate planning attorney is to make sure people are making informed decisions. And then based on a current life snapshot, that's one of the most important things to remember when creating an estate plan is you have to have, keep the mindset of what if you died yesterday? I like saying yesterday, not today or tomorrow. You've already survived yesterday, um, but it has to be based on a current life snapshot, um, not some hypothetical scenario in the future. Um, and then ultimately, what provides you peace of mind? Um, a lot of people get to peace of mind in different ways. And then in terms of a current life snapshot, a lot of people will say, I, you know, I don't want to go do my estate plan because I don't like thinking about you know, death. I don't, I, I'm not ready because I don't have enough information to provide. Uh, but it's actually not that difficult. You don't have to provide a lot of detailed information at that first meeting. For a first estate planning initial consultation to be effective, you basically have to know a current life snapshot that one, includes your goals, what do you want to have happen to your stuff when you die, um, but two, what, who your family is, what do you own, do you own your home, approximately how much is it worth, do you have retirement accounts, about how much, you don't need to know what the account numbers are or the specific dollar amount because that changes, but as long as you know or what you want to know about what it's worth, that usually will provide for uh, a productive initial consultation. And then to know if you have designated beneficiary options, um, because it's very important uh, to make sure your designated beneficiary op options are consistent with your overall plan. So with that in mind, you are ready for an, an initial consultation. Designated beneficiaries, it's important because they control how those assets are are distributed after your lifetime, no matter what your will or your trust says. So the documents, uh, that the basic documents that are part of every estate plan generally include these documents that you see on the PowerPoint. Um, a will, disposition of remains, a trust, uh, power attorney, advanced healthcare directive, um, sometimes a HIPAA release form as well. I like this slide because it groups the documents after death, used during life, um, because it's very important to know when these documents are to be used and how they're to be used. That gives you a better idea. Um, a trust is kind of in the middle. A trust is the only document that can be utilized during your life and after your life. The other documents are either during or after. We are going to talk about what a trust is um, because the most common question I get as an estate planning attorney when I'm having an initial conversation with a client is what's the difference between a will and a trust, do I need a trust? A trust, you have to have a purpose. You know, you don't just set up a trust. No one inherently just needs a trust for just because it's a trust. There should be a purpose. Um, the type, revocable or irrevocable, if it's revocable, that means you can amend it. Um, there has to be a trustee, the person responsible to manage the, the property that's in the trust. There needs to be beneficiaries, those who enjoy the property that's in the trust. There needs to be assets in the trust. Um, sometimes the only asset in a trust is $1. Other times people will put a bunch of other assets. We'll talk about that into the trust. And then um, the trust generally will just have to terminate at some point. And so oh, all those terms will be written in the trust. A trust is really just a contract um, that explains how you want things. Um, so they can say a lot of things. My job as an estate planning attorney is to kind of guide people to make sure um, your goals are accomplished in a way 
that is effective and not ambiguous. So then um, a, a revocable living trust is what we're talking about right now, revocable living trust. That's when someone says I have a trust that's part of their own estate plan, nine out of 10 times they're talking about a revocable living trust, which is what we're going to explain right now. Um, and so a revocable living trust is very different during your life if you set it up versus after your life. So first we're going to talk about how um, a revocable living trust works during your lifetime, the person who sets up the trust. Um, first of all, we're talking the revocable means it's amendable, so you can change it whenever you want, as long as you're living with capacity. When you set up the trust, generally, you're the grantor. Grantor is the word we use. Some trusts use the word settlor, some trustor. Uh, we like to use the word grantor, uh, but they're all interchangeable terms. And so you're usually the trustee of your own trust. Um, and then you're also, no matter what, the beneficiary. You don't have to be the trustee of your own revocable living trust, but you are, as long as you're living, always the beneficiary. And then um, while you're living, if you create a revocable living trust, the assets, you have to decide whether you wanna transfer into the trust or not. And so the first step is to create an estate plan. And if your estate plan includes a trust, then the second step is to figure out how to incorporate that trust into your assets. So do you want to transfer certain assets in or not? Do you wanna name the trust as a designated beneficiary on retirement or life insurance or not? Uh, and so that's also advice that we provide. We'll terminate at some point. Um, and we'll talk about that. You can always terminate it during your life. If you decide you no longer want the trust, you can terminate it. Generally, once you have a trust, uh, people will just continue to amend it throughout their lives. Usually trusts aren't revoked unless there's a real specific reason why you want to revoke your own revocable living trust during your life. Usually you just amend it to make sure it's consistent with whatever your goals are at any given point in your life. So then what happens to the trust after your lifetime? it becomes irrevocable. No one can change it. Only you can change it during your life with capacity. So then when you die, your, your trust becomes irrevocable because it has to carry out your wishes. So nobody else can change it. And usually the purpose for having a trust continue after your lifetime is to control your legacy. Um, because for the most part, when you have an estate plan and you wanna leave someone an inheritance, you always want the inheritance to benefit that individual. Uh, and so in some cases, there are um, scenarios where the inheritance would not benefit the individual because they're not good at managing money or there's other scenarios. And so uh, I'll talk about different ways or the most common times I see people trying to control their legacy after this slide. And then um, after your lifetime, of course, you can no longer be your trustee. So there's a successor trustee that steps in um, or you can have co-trustees in the will. You can also have co-personal representatives. Um, I usually like when there's just one personal representative or one trustee. Uh, in my experience, um, a lot of times people have co-trustees when they only have two children and they can't pick between the two children because you know, I guess when there's two siblings, I'm one of four, but when there are two siblings, I guess the sibling rivalry is sometimes more common. Uh, and so the successor trustee, if they don't become the trustee during your lifetime, then they become the trustee after your lifetime. And so let's say you, own, you, you, have, you set up a trust and you have your property in your trust. That means that when you die, that property, if that was the only asset that would trigger probate, the other asset that would trigger probate would be bank accounts that total $100,000 or more or assets that total $100,000 or more that don't have any sort of designated beneficiaries or rights of survivorship. So your home is in your trust, and instead of going through the probate process, the successor trustee signs a simple paragraph saying, my dad, my mom is no longer a trustee because they're deceased, and I accept my role as the new trustee. And with that paragraph signed in the death certificate, the trustee can carry out the wishes. Whatever the trust says, they can do right then and there. So they don't have to ask permission um, from the state to have the authority to um, carry out 
your wishes. And then the beneficiaries after your lifetime, it's whoever you as the grantor decide the beneficiaries are. So in a trust or in a will, you can always say, I want this person to get X amount of dollars, this percentage. Um, a lot of people like using percentages because they don't know how much their overall net worth is going to be when they die. Um, and so in a will, you can do all of that. But as soon as there are provisions that say, um, provided however, those are my two favorite words, provided however, in a trust, um, I want the funds to only be used for education. Whenever you have some sort of condition based um, on the inheritance, that requires a trust. A will can only be outright distributions to beneficiaries. If you want to have any sort of conditions of how the funds or property is used after your lifetime, a trust is 100% needed. Um, and then the assets, if you don't transfer them into your trust during your life, will be poured over into your trust pursuant to the pour over will. And then the trust terminates whenever um, the trust says it terminates. Like I said, the trust is just a contract that can say anything and it will say this trust terminates at this point in time. Um, and so that will become more clear on the next slide when um, we talk about the common scenarios I see when people want to control their legacy. So for example, um, well, there's a picture of me wearing my mask. I'm wearing masks these days like everyone. So um, I have to talk for about an hour during the initial consultation. And oh, not the initial consultations I'm doing on the phone, but this is a signing meeting and those last about an hour. And so I'm trying to get used to speaking to a microphone. This is, I mean, speaking into a mask. Um, uh, and anyway, the most common scenarios I see when people are trying to control their legacy. One is a mixed family. Um, so that's one common uh, scenario that I see. Another one is with young beneficiaries, whether they're, they're your children or they're your grandchildren or nieces and nephews. Also, if you have a special needs beneficiary who will never be able to manage their own, um, manage their own finances. Other reasons why people set up living trusts is for tax planning and then probate avoidance and then asset protection um, just to be clear it's not asset protection for the grantor um, and so and since i'm talking about revocable living trust trust i'm just going to briefly go over irrevocable trust irrevocable trust however you want to say it um, basically means it cannot be changed once you set up this trust and you put something in it the trust controls what happens to whatever assets you put into that trust. So you have to be very sure um, that you want that trust to exist uh, before you create it and transfer assets into it. Um, and so generally, the type of clients that we have are young families who are um, worried and concerned about their minor children. You know, we always go through their asset list and the most important asset are my children. And business owners who are concerned about succession planning, making sure they're our funds and a procedure in place. Multi-generational families, especially ones that own lots of land that they, and they want to have joint owners and they're passing down wealth to grandchildren maybe. Um, and Kapuna who mostly are concerned about incapacity planning. And then new Hawaii residents um, who create, who have created an estate plan outside the state of Hawaii, um, moved to Hawaii. A good rule of thumb is always to review an estate plan in the state where you currently reside. And so we do a lot of reviews of estate plans for clients, a Hawaii attorney to review and give the stamp of approval because all the states are different. Again, we are talking today about um, state Hawaii. So if you have um, any further questions, please feel free to call my office or shoot us an email, maybe even FaceTime or Zoom. Uh, we're going to incorporate that more into our practice. Like I said, all of our initial meetings are over the phone right now um, or FaceTime. And then we are doing signing meetings with social distancing standards in place. Thank you for joining us. And I think I will be signing off. Aloha.